Um, and so uh, while what looks, what problems you have on your property may be different, I hope that uh, you can glean some of this information and we can apply it to uh, whatever scale or species that you're facing uh, at home or uh, other land that you manage. So uh, biological evasion as a whole has a lot of consequences, um, one of which is just simply native species displacement. We know our habitats are um, you know, limited resource spatially, and as uh, new species, exotic species infiltrate those areas, uh, two species can't co-occur at the same place at the same time, so something's gotta give. We also have an uh, alteration of the uh, structure and composition of whatever habitat these exotics find themselves in. And uh, this is probably not an uncommon view uh, here in the Southeast of your walk in the woods, potentially, where uh, the image here on the right shows a couple of people trying to maneuver through an understory full of Asian privet. Uh, here in this stand of uh, hardwoods and pine, most likely, um, uh, this understory shrub layer was most likely much more open. Um, and so you have this structural component that obscures the, the view shed and uh, alters how uh, wildlife, uh, including humans, move through uh, this landscape. Um, Ultimately, there is an overall reduction in species diversity when exotics uh, invade into a native habitat. Clearly, in the beginning, um, uh, adding a new species technically increases species diversity. But over time, as these exotics uh, 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 spread, they take up space that was, that was likely for native species, and then you get a trend of downward species diversity. And one of the things that, that I feel is the strongest uh, reason to monitor and maintain our landscapes free of invasives is that as they continue to spread and cause problems in our native landscapes, they can drive native species to endangerment, particularly if they are uh, sensitive or imperiled to begin with for other you know, based on other um, uh, issues regarding their habitat. When uh, invasive species come into the mix, it just creates another issue. And in my view, this is probably the, the largest basis for the federal government's response to, to these uh, invasive species uh, management methods. So clearly the Endangered Species Act um, uh, mandates that no federal agency uh, whether through action or inaction, can lead to a species uh, extinction. And so they're charged with effectively making sure common species stay common and endangered species uh, not only don't go extinct, but, but hopefully through long-term management actually can rebound. And so while there are other directives that require the federal government to act uh, to manage uh, invasive species, I think the the uh, Endangered Species Act, particularly when dealing with sensitive species, is, uh, is one of the hallmarks to the, the charge to address these issues. And not to be outdone is the economic uh, impacts of uh, biological invasion. Clearly, just removing them uh, costs money. Everything costs money. And so um, uh, whether that's uh, ecological, um, uh, resources that are lost, uh, a timber crop that is imperiled because of biological invasion, uh, water quality, what have you. Uh, I definitely wanted to uh, mention that, although I think we're all like-minded in that we're, we're especially concerned with the uh, ecological impacts. So, so what makes a species invasive? You know, we know, we know what happens once, once that uh, invasive species uh, propagates, but uh, if we're looking at a brand new exotic species, how can we tell whether or not it's going to be invasive? Uh, unfortunately, if it's, a, if it's a, an especially novel um, exotic, there's likely not very much information on how it's going to grow, say in Tennessee, if it came from like East Asia. So uh, it, it's sometimes hard to determine whether or not it's going to have a particular risk of invasion. 
but we can look at other hallmarks like uh, whether or not it has a wide range of ecological uh, tolerances. Can it survive in its native habitat in the uplands as well as the, the, the bottomlands? Um, how does it reproduce? Is it a precocious flower? Or does it produce hundreds of seeds or, or single numbers of seeds? How long does it take to mature? Uh, things like that. We also have to consider its dispersal mechanism. Uh, is it animal dispersed like mammal uh, dispersal or is it uh, perhaps dispersed by birds or even uh, by wind? And so uh, a great example, unfortunately, is uh, Chinese privet. Uh, it uh, blooms very vigorously. It, uh, it produces lots and lots of seeds and the birds eat it up like candy and they can fly it for, for miles. And so uh, that's a, a sort of the poster child in this respect for, um, for, for, a, for a clearly uh, potentially high invasive species. Uh, and so considering those things, we have to understand what is the risk of it outcompeting the native habitat that uh, it, it is introduced to. Um, but luckily or unluckily, depending on how you look at it, uh, the species that we're concerned of at a particular uh, time is, is not likely to be totally new uh, to uh, the region that we're, that we're in. So for example, if we're concerned of a new species in Tennessee, maybe it came from Georgia. We can look at what habitats it, it uh, persisted in in Georgia and track how it spread. Uh, and in that respect, we can understand how its invasive history uh, was. How did it act in Georgia, essentially? Or how did it act in Kentucky? so that we can guide our response in Tennessee. Um, uh, another related uh, question is, uh, what's its current distribution? Is there a recent outbreak many miles disjunct from its, what was thought to be its uh, uh, boundaries? So then we can uh, sort of understand how it's escaping uh, perhaps cultivation or uh, determine whether or not control methods were effective or not based on a recent outbreak somewhere else. Uh, another thing to consider is, more locally is what suitable habitat do you have on your property that um, uh, this particular invasive species uh, prefers? So for example, if it's a, if it's a wetland invasive is, or is it a riparian invasive that uh, uh, takes over uh, those wet habitats, and on your property, it's all dry upland. So on a local level, that species may not be a big a concern to your property. And uh, in the same respect, the, the National Park Service uh, considers that factor as well. Um, another local thing to consider is, uh, what is the risk of this invasive species to other native species, particularly those that are imperiled or in sensitive habitats? And in our area, a good example are the limestone glades. And if a new species uh, or a new exotic species is found uh, in proximity to a particular sensitive habitat like a glade, um, while it might not be spreading rampantly elsewhere amongst the park, that, uh, that on the large scale is not an issue. But at that small scale, if it were to invade uh, a sensitive habitat, it could, it could have a high risk of uh, uh, damage to that, to that habitat, and then uh, would require increased efforts uh, around these sensitive sites. Uh, but, but all that to say is whether we have the uh, playbook uh, memorized for a new exotic species or not, um, we all understand that our natives are important in uh, maintaining a lot of ecological uh, services. Uh, they're just good to look at and, and we prefer them in general. And so if we were faced with a new exotic species, uh, when in doubt, just simply take it out. So we talked about the problems of invasive species, kind of what makes us an invasive species, but from the National Park Service level, uh, who's really watching uh, for these uh, invasive species issues? And so I did, did just want to go through a little bit of hierarchy here from the Park Service. Um, first and foremost, I guess, the uh, local park resource management division 
uh, has the final say on any and all um, uh, uh, issues related to natural resource management on a particular park. However, uh, especially in smaller parks for, like, like Chickamauga Chattanooga, uh, there's not a very robust staff always that have the expertise to deal with uh, uh, wide, uh, you know, uh, landscape management issues in, uh, in a, you know, um, invasive species management being one of those. So at the regional level, uh, the National Park Service has other divisions that help facilitate parks in their decision making and even uh, provide active support on the ground. And so these two entities uh, at the regional level are the invasive plant management team and on the other side is the inventory and monitoring networks. Um, they have similar duties but in you know the, the, the largest uh, uh, differentiation between these two groups is that the invasive uh, plant management team uh, they actually offer uh, direct support to the park with personnel assigned um, periodically. They sort of travel park to park and uh, actively manage and assist local park management on removing invasive species. The inventory and monitoring networks are much more, you know, like they like the name suggests. They're they're much more in the management recommendation uh, field. They do offer on the ground technical assistance. But uh, generally, they are uh, 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 driven more by, by monitoring and inventorying scientifically, uh, tracking uh, long-term trends of, uh, of problems and other, other issues related to natural resources throughout the parks. Um, and so, so they, they have much more of a hands-off role. Specifically in our region, um, the, the Southeast IPMT, are those who come uh, to parks like Chickamauga, uh, Russell Cave, Stones River, uh, parks like that and, and assist on the ground. Whereas uh, the Cumberland Piedmont Network, again, are just uh, the, 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 the specific regional division that, that informs our local parks. Uh, they overlap a lot of the same parks between these two divisions, um, but essentially, this paints the picture for, for example, how Chickamauga Chattanooga uh, uh, takes care of natural resource management between the local park uh, expertise and then outsourcing a lot of the information gathering and manpower that it takes to, uh, to deal with some of our natural resources. Uh, I'm actually excited to say that I've just accepted a position with the Cumberland Piedmont Network starting in July and I'm very uh, uh, excited about the opportunity to uh, be involved with their organization. Uh, I'll have the opportunity to travel uh, a little bit. And so uh, while I'll be based out of Mammoth Cave, uh, I will periodically come back to Chickamauga. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay, so we have all this information, but how does the park respond? Uh, prevention is ideal. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult, if not impossible. All of our parks or other properties, whether that's private or, or, or what have you, uh, are intersected by roads. We have waterways like creeks or rivers that come through. Uh, particularly with parks, we have lots of visitors on horseback or on foot. And then we also have to consider the uh, specific uh, characteristics of the species themselves. Uh, for instance, are they wind dispersed or animal dispersed, what have you. So uh, an invasive species doesn't know that once it reaches that park boundary, not to go any further, uh, if there's suitable habitat across the, the property line, it's going to grow there just as easily. And so it's almost impossible, you know, uh, really to prevent these invasive species from popping up. Instead, what we're left with are primarily this uh, um, early detection and rapid response. And so this is kind of the hallmark of uh, high quality uh, early, um, early detection. Uh, essentially, it, it describes exactly how it sounds, where if we can catch a new exotic invasive species from the beginning, when there's only one to a hundred stems potentially, uh, our likelihood of eliminating that as an issue uh, is, is much higher. 
uh, particularly in um, reducing the ecological damage as well as the uh, economic resources required to address the problem. Unfortunately, because our parks are understaffed and uh, we, we oversee lots of property, it is actually very hard to implement this EDRR um, perfectly. So unfortunately, oftentimes what the park is facing are already well-established populations of exotic invasive species that require uh, long-term, intensive, and expensive management efforts uh, across the landscape. So jumping into a little more detail on uh, the EDRR principle itself, uh, this graph here on the left really highlights the need uh, for this principle. Once a species is introduced, it takes a little while for the public or the, the management entity to recognize it as a problem. Uh, during this period from its introduction, we might be still gathering information on whether or not it's an issue or, or, or not. Uh, and we have all of these other issues, other invasive species that we're dealing with. So it is a very difficult thing to implement this EDRR practice uh, perfectly. Uh, and so essentially what this graph shows is that by the time um, our, our efforts are put into place to address a new species, uh, it's likely that the species is already widespread. Um, therefore, the cost of the control and even the management methods that we could be using are the costs go up and our management methods are, are limited, uh, not to mention uh, the likelihood of, of eradicating that species as a, as a whole is, is often uh, unfeasible. So clearly, while this is a great practice and it shows how effective that we can be at minimizing new exotic species from causing uh, ecological harm, uh, by the time that we come about to managing them, it's, it's oftentimes we're left with this long-term approach. So when the park, uh, and, and, and this, this can be uh, something you guys consider as well, uh, when we finally get around, <laughs> unfortunately, to, to removing a species of, of interest, uh, there are many things that we have to consider to drive both our, uh, uh, how we respond and what methods we can use to remove that particular species. One of which is where are we in the curve? Uh, is it the first time anyone's noticed this new exotic or is it a whole 20 acre plot of a, of a dense um, uh, occurrence of this particular species? The other thing again related is, is scale and, and location. So uh, are we talking about a small uh, single field along the side of the visitor center or is it the whole uh, you know, southwestern unit of the Chickamauga battlefield. The other thing to consider is terrain. Uh, are we talking about a nice flat area that has easy access to and from, or is it along a steep slope or embankment? Uh, these factors all play into how, uh, what management methods we actually can use. Uh, the other thing is uh, resources. Do we have the money and the manpower to throw at a particular uh, uh, exotic species, and again ties back into how intensive uh, a, a management uh, method or plan we need to develop. Also, do we have the expertise? So is there some sort of knowledge gap between uh, the local park staff and the region? Do we have, or can we outsource that information to, to understand what sort of plan or approach that we need to use. Uh, and again, uh, person power. Are we a staff of five or 50? And can we, can we again outsource some of that, that person power to say a volunteer group? Or uh, do we need to actually uh, hire in a, a company to come um, handle certain things for us? And then, and then lastly, but certainly not, not least, is the species characteristics themselves. Uh, how, what species is it? What do we know about it in particular? 
if we were to remove it by hand, say, what what happens to uh, the the re-sprouts? Is it something that re-sprouts vigorous, vigorously or, or has the ability to coppice? Um, does it propagate vegetatively? So, so something like uh, Japanese honeysuckle, uh, you know, you're pulling on that, you're pulling on the, the vine and you think you've got all 10 feet of it, but, but actually it's 45 feet long. Uh, the other thing to consider is the seed bank viability. So uh, do we, what do we know about the seed bank? Uh, have there been any studies about it? Uh, and so knowing what we can or, or, or rather maybe what we don't know, um, that, that all kind of comes back in, especially considering how we readdress or reattack a particular area once we've left it. Uh, and then finally, how big is it? Uh, or, or rather, is it flowering? Can it wait a year? Or does it need to be um, uh, removed immediately? Uh, size also plays a big role there. So uh, what I'll show later is, a, is a, an example where we had to take out large ailanthus trees. Something like that, we can't pull by hand if it's 30 feet tall. And so um, I wanted to sort of prime our decision making um, as we move into what we actually, or, or what methods we actually use to remove exotic species. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, the mechanical removal by hand or some sort of non-chemical basis is ideal. Uh, that's the primary method that the Park Service employs, uh, but after running through that whole list of considerations, I, I wanted you to know right off the bat that unfortunately, oftentimes, uh, because of these factors involved with a particular exotic species, uh, chemical treatment or herbicide uh, is, is often um, the only resort uh, considering scale and, and most likely uh, person power. Uh, we have lots of property to manage and not very many people to do so. And uh, some of the mechanical removal methods are just simply cost prohibitive. So uh, going back into our primary removal method, uh, mostly by hand pulling. These are effective, uh, or this is an effective technique on small plants and those with shallow roots uh, privet is a good example that can be removed by hand, whether that's physically pulling it with your hands or using one of these um, uh, lever action uh, uh, uprooters, or um, uh, they've got a whole bunch of different proprietary names, but uh, weed wrench is another one. Uh, removal methods by hand are, are very good for uh, you know, utilizing large numbers of volunteers. So um, I think the city helped coordinate uh, or not the city, but another group helped coordinate a citywide invasive species uh, uh, management day, and the park did uh, utilize that resource tied in, I think, with reflection riding on um, removing some exotics along the Kitty Trail not long ago. I think it was in March. Uh, and so that's a good example, uh, as well as using Boy Scouts or other, other um, uh, you know, free labor in addressing these uh, larger scale issues where otherwise we might have to use another method. Uh, the downside here is if the species is a particular uh, or to particularly vigorous re-sprouter, if there are roots left behind from, from pulling them, um, um, the species could come back or that individual could re-sprout or worse, uh, maybe that disturbance causes um, maybe acts as a propagation method, uh, creating more, is more problem than when we started. Another issue with hand pulling, unfortunately, is the disturbance to the soil. Um, clearly, it's not an issue perhaps on, uh, on flat terrain, but say we're on a steep embankment, uh, if, we, if we pull up a lot of species by hand or individuals by hand, now we've potentially disturbed a large area of soil and, and perhaps it rains the next day and now we have an erosion issue. So we all ha also have to consider that. Um, another uh, viable method is fire management. Um, in some cases, fire management can be used as a sole uh, removal method, depending on the species, uh, especially if it's a shallow rooted species that uh, uh, 
a prescribed burn could actually kill those roots of the new exotic. But oftentimes, excuse me, it's, it's uh, used in, in concert with other methods. Uh, so likely we will prescribe burn a, a plot and, and essentially monitor what comes back. So we've killed off a lot of the biomass so that we can focus on identifying uh, the exotic species and removing them when they're small re-sprouts. Uh, another uh, method is using land clearing equipment, whether that's uh, simply mowing. Uh, there's actually some evidence to suggest that kudzu responds very negatively to mowing over just a few uh, growing seasons. Uh, unfortunately, we know most of the time kudzu was planted along very steep embankments where mowing might be dangerous. Uh, yet again, another example of, of how we have to consider all of the factors when choosing a, a removal method. Uh, another uh, uh, method is this technique called mulching, where you see here in this top image, uh, it is a specialized uh, uh, attachment on like a, a skid steer that just goes through and, and churns up all of the, the vegetation in its path. Uh, this method is clearly not ideal for sensitive uh, sites, uh, particularly because it's non-selective. It doesn't care what's in front of it, it's going to churn it up and, and, and chop it up. Uh, but if it's a uh, relatively stable site that's very dense with a particular species, uh, this could be a viable method. So when, um, oh, excuse me, let me go back. When these mechanical methods are either not viable options or uh, they've been used and have to be supplemented with herbicide treatment. Uh, the herbicide treatment can be used effectively, but clearly uh, we want to make sure that mechanical removal methods have been exhausted before uh, herbicides are applied. Uh, and a couple of uh, uh, herbicide methods that I've used is the, uh, the basal uh, treatment, where essentially you're coating the lower portion of a, of a trunk uh, essentially girdling the tree, killing it from the, you know, severing its tie from the uh, roots to the, the laminar tissue. Uh, a foliar treatment is essentially just dousing the leaves in, in herbicide. Uh, this is my least favorite method. It is certainly, I think, fraught with the most um, risk, uh, you know, whether it's a windy day, or, you know, so, so you have uh, overspray and you get herbicide landing on non-target species. Uh, but also, even under controlled environments, um, uh, herbicides can, can volatilize. And uh, there's a term called uh, uh, herbicide pruning, where although you're being very diligent and spraying the, the, just the leaves of the, the species or the individuals you're targeting, uh, if it's a particularly hot day or something like that, um, that herbicide can volatilize and come in contact with overhead branches of non-target species. And then you come back uh, on your next visit and you see dead branches that uh, are, are lower hanging. And so clearly this is something that should only be used in or perhaps open areas on non-windy days uh, and when you have just dense um, uh, population or occurrence. Of a, of a target species. Uh, one of the most effective methods, I believe, is this cut stump treatment. So you're um, uh, cutting the target species or individual right down to the, the ground level and then immediately dousing it with a um, uh, herbicide treatment, but only on the exposed surface of the, of the stem. So taking all of that in mind, I want to walk you through some uh, actual management um, uh, activities that the Park Service has been active um, in, in addressing exotic species at a couple different locations. So first we'll look at uh, Eagle's Nest. Uh, this is by far the most intensive attack we've, we've uh, done uh, in my tenure with the park. Uh, and then the Upper Truck Trail is a great example of an EDRR uh, approach. Uh, and then again, we'll, we'll, we'll look at lastly, the Orchard Knob Reservation. So a uh, little backstory here, the Eagle's Nest is about a two and a half acre plot. 
Um, and unfortunately, at the time of our first visit, it was very dense with invasive species. Uh, and because of that density and our uh, uh, small uh, manpower, uh, we, we had to use an herbicide treatment. Uh, here we were targeting Chinese privet. Uh, it certainly wasn't the most widespread species, which, which was a good thing to not have to deal with it specifically, uh, but there were, there were some that we had to address. Uh, one of the more unique issues here was large ailanthus trees, uh, uh, tree of heaven. There was about 10 of these and they were between 8 to 12 inches in diameter and some were as tall as 30 feet. And in particular, several were hanging over the road and I'll show an aerial image here in just a moment. Um, one of the funnest species to address was this uh, Japanese spirea. Uh, it was the lowest number uh, as far as density goes, but it was unique in that it was actually uh, clinging to the cliffs or the crags on the cliffs and uh, we, we had to do some repelling, which was, was actually a lot of fun. Um, and so by far the most widespread species in this area was the uh, uh, armor honeysuckle, so the um, uh, Lanistra macchiae. Uh, it formed very dense patches and we had, uh, we had a lot to address there. Uh, here is just an overview of the uh, ranges of these target species, uh, moving from, from left to right here at the top. Uh, the the, the uh, Lingustrum species, so all of the privets, are very well established in the southeast, unfortunately. And aside from two counties uh, in Tennessee, it's, 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 it's statewide. Uh, and so looking at all of these and then comparing that to this uh, Spirea japonica or the, the Japanese Spirea, um, the other three species in this area uh, are certainly, in my view, likely beyond uh, eradication. Um, we, we're, we're effectively in a long-term management of those particular species. The, the Japanese Spirea, however, we might be able to get a hold on that uh, as comparatively, it's, it's a much uh, smaller issue uh, as of now. And I wanted to highlight these all came from this EDD maps. Uh, that's a, a resource that we can get out to you. It's a great visual aid for understanding where uh, exotic uh, invasive species are, are most prevalent. So here we are, this baseball shape here is a, a more or less the boundary of Eagle's Nest or, or effectively the area we were treating. And we focused a lot on our first attempt uh, right there at the base uh, of the cliffs in this sort of bowl, uh, moving along the road there uh, on the flat uh, terrain. Uh, so here we are actually utilizing the cut stump treatment to uh, address the uh, widespread uh, honeysuckle invasion. You know, just about everything you see there, all the little opposite leaf sprigs sort of uh, bending up into the left or right, that's all uh, small stems of, of honeysuckle. And so just out of frame here is another coworker of mine uh, taking a small chainsaw and, and cutting down uh, to, to the ground uh, these um, uh, honeysuckle stems. And uh, uh, this coworker of mine is coming almost immediately behind him and uh, spraying just the exposed surface of the cut stump uh, with herbicide. On our second visit, we retreated this lower area, but then focused on the uh, actual uh, cliff brow. Uh, here we are uh, re-attacking an escape or a re-sprout of a honeysuckle uh, by again cutting it back down to the base and then uh, uh, hitting it with a little herbicide on that exposed cut surface. And for the fun part, uh, the third visit we, we, we went here, we actually addressed the spirea um, as well as some honeysuckle uh, and privet along the cliff crags and on some of the landings below. Uh, these, these two uh, gentlemen are from the Southeastern Invasive Plant Management Team. Uh, and again, they offer a unique set of resources to the park uh, and expertise in how to manage uh, our exotic species. Uh, they clearly are well trained in a, a wide variety of management techniques and even some special skills like repelling that they were able to uh, teach us how to do so that we could assist them in this effort. 
so here we are. I'm actually, this is me coming down the, the uh, uh, cliff. Uh, and, and I want to point out that while we are forced to use herbicide in some of these um, uh, management techniques, because the, the soil on these cliff crags are very thin, uh, what I could pull by hand was the primary method and then larger specimens I had to uh, use an herbicide treatment to cut stuff. Now, moving to the actual, uh, or sorry, to the upper truck trail, um, this was a, just a linear approach. Uh, it's about a mile and a half long trail. And the target species here was the leatherleaf mahonia. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a up and coming uh, invasive species. And so in this respect, we were operating much more on an EDRR uh, principle. Uh, and I wanted to point out here this, this idea of opportunistic monitoring. Uh, clearly agencies or, or rather divisions within the Park Service, like the Cumberland Piedmont Network, they have established plots where they go and actively monitor uh, on an annual basis or, or, or five-year basis uh, particular plots. And on, on those visits, they are tracking invasive species. But what's more common is this opportunistic approach where um, what happened in this case, I was uh, assisting another uh, survey of bats uh, in February. And along our trek to and from the caves, uh, I noticed this uh, leatherleaf mahonia. And so I made a note to make sure we came back to visit these sites and remove them. Uh, and so it just happened that we were out about looking around because uh, we can't, you know, we can't make a grid or a, or a plot, survey plot across 9,000 acres. We just have to always keep an eye out for invasive species as we're doing other tasks uh, across the park. So uh, this is leatherleaf mahonia spread according to the EDD maps. Uh, so again, recall that uh, the lingustrum or privet species are very widespread. And so considering that, uh, it's likely that we can get a handle on mahonia before it becomes uh, a statewide problem. So here's just the outline of the upper truck trail. And specifically, we were uh, highlighting this area here what had the highest density of these individuals. Um, and because there were low numbers of individuals requiring much less manpower on relatively stable sites, we used uh, hand pulling methods uh, by those uh, uh, weed wrenches. So uh, we were able to address or, or remove about 60 stems of uh, Mahonia and uh, there's plans to come back and revisit to attack uh, any uh, re-sprouts or escapes as needed. So we'll close or with the invasive approach here at, uh, at the Orchard Knob Reservation. So this is a, a larger plot, although we weren't addressing the whole area, uh, but it's about a six acre plot. And although the invasive species in this area, particularly the woody invasive species, I'll, I'll say that, uh, are relatively sparse. Um, but because of the terrain that we were uh, working in, uh, we were forced to use an herbicide treatment as to not contribute to erosion. And so there are some special concerns here with Orchard Knob. Uh, if, if I'm sure many of you have come and, and seen this, this uh, location, uh, but one of my favorite uh, rare species there is the, the Fremont leather flower. So the Clematis Fremontii is a, a very cool, uh, very cool plant. And uh, uh, the, the habitat itself is sensitive. So this is a glade, uh, prairie complex, you know, characterized by thin soils, exposed bedrock, uh, and it's a very harsh environment. So uh, considering those factors, uh, we were still confident that we could effectively treat targeted uh, areas with herbicide. And so here we were looking at uh, uh, a removal of cow repair, and because it was a, you know, Orchard Knob is downtown Chattanooga, surrounded by lots of residential, you know, homes, uh, Bradford pear is a very popular ornamental tree. Uh, when it escapes the cultivation, it reverts back to its uh, wild type, which is the, the Pyrus caleriana, and we were attacking that with the cut stump treatment. Uh, also, lots of uh, Lanicera macchiae and, and several specimens or individuals of the mimosa trees. 
So here is uh, highlighted in yellow the actual uh, treatment plot or, or rather expanse of the, the area we were treating, uh, focusing on this western uh, third, if you will, of the reservation. And I wanted to highlight the steep slopes here. So this is a, just a zoomed in Google Earth image. And uh, along this uh, uh, boundary closest to you, you know, viewing uh, is this steep slope. And so it was a, a greater risk of soil erosion on, a, uh, on the steep slope that, that uh, we felt was, was not appropriate to use these hand pulling methods because we didn't want to disturb that soil. So here we are actually doing uh, the cut stump treatment. So a coworker is um, uh, nipping the, um, this uh, calorie pair right there at the base. And then a, my other coworker is, is following immediately behind with an herbicide treatment. So here I wanted to highlight the, the advantages and disadvantages of the foliar treatment. So this was a uh, relatively dense stand of, of uh, uh, the Lanicera macchiae, um, where a foliar treatment had been applied. And uh, this is on our second visit that we're you know, the foliar application was used the first visit, and now we're revisiting this site and coming back to readdress some, some things we may have missed. <clears throat> One reason I'm, I'm typically against foliar treatment is, although the above ground biomass here was, was likely initially killed, the treatment was not effective enough to actually kill the root system. And so what we're left with are all of these re-sprouts here down at the base, uh, signifying, you know, healthy roots potentially that are just fine carrying on uh, growing again. And so if we, we as the park service or, or just land managers in general are concerned with uh, our resources, both natural and financial, uh, manpower and things of that nature, uh, considering the other uh, uh, negatives to uh, foliar spray, uh, specifically those non-target species effects, uh, I think we need to focus more in on, on methods that require um, less revisiting, and in particular those that have a lower threshold of risk when it comes to damaging non-target species. And so here we are having to, to essentially kill these plants again uh, after using what I would call a high-risk uh, uh, method of approach. So that closes the invasive species side of things. And I do just want to end uh, briefly on how the park is managing native species. Um, in open habitats, particularly those like limestone glades, savannas, and woodlands, um, changes to disturbance patterns, whether that's periodic fire or even uh, herbivory by, by, uh, by bison or, or what have you, um, we have changed in many cases the successional stages of these particular habitats. So uh, essentially what we're left with are, are, are open habitats that are filling up with native and of course invasive species. Um, and and an another contributing factor here had, was, was, was in large part fire suppression as well. Uh, and so we're getting crowded in what was otherwise open habitats. And while uh, I don't think it's appropriate to consider native species invasive, um, as, as we have altered these disturbance patterns, we're, we're allowing succession to take place and, and closing in what was likely more open habitats. And this is especially concerned uh, uh, across limestone glades in particular because the, the park here at Chickamauga has many of them. And it's a rare uh, habitat that uh, is host to many endemic species. So um, one thing to note, however, as we are managing these limestone glades in particular, uh, we have to be selective in our removal methods uh, because how we kill a, a native or non-native species in these open spaces, uh, we have to be mindful of the rare and endemic species that may surround them. Uh, but also in the physical act of removing them um, could damage the hydrology given that uh, many of these soils in the glades are very thin or, or in some cases non-existent. 
So uh, I did want to just show you, this was a survey I was involved in on uh, the glades down in Chickamauga with the Cumberland Piedmont Network. So here we are laying out transects and uh, uh, doing one meter grids uh, along the parallel transects, uh, uh, counting both invas uh, invasive and, and native species. Um, and so what we see here is down the center line of the glade, um, we're, we're, we're monitoring both uh, the herbaceous level, but also the woody cover as it's encroaching upon the glades. Um, areas like this, where there's almost no organic matter, are not likely to be invaded by a woody species or, or a, a non-native woody species even. Uh, and so it's, it's not these particular exposed bedrock regions that we're typically concerned with. Um, but as we move out of those areas, um, um, the glades were typically or, or, or likely surrounded by uh, prairies that moved into woodlands and into forests. As those forests come into the woodlands and then establish in the surrounding prairies, we get on the boundary of these glades, very dense habitat uh, or, or, or uh, expanse of native and non-native woody species. And so it's these areas, particularly around the perimeter, that we have to focus on removing uh, the woody material so that these uh, um, uh, endemic species that require uh, sun and these harsh conditions are allowed to thrive. So uh, with that, um, we are working with the Cumberland Piedmont Network on this particular uh, uh, data that they've collected and formulating a plan to uh, address woody encroachment uh, because just the same as um, habitat fragmentation, for example, is an issue to our native landscapes or, or uh, natural resources, so are uh, forest encroachments onto um, uh, dwindling resources like glades and savannas and prairies. So that is a, a major focus of the park and something that we're uh, in the middle of uh, formulating our approach to and so unfortunately I don't have any uh, examples of removal in this uh, area but but it's something that, that should be coming soon. So with that I will close and just uh, put up here kind of uh, um, what to consider you know uh, on, on, on how we're dealing with these invasive species and and always understand that uh, first and foremost, we try to ensure we implement sustainable practices like um, uh, mechanical removal, but there's a number of factors that play into that uh, where, where it might not be the most feasible or um, um, instantaneous approach to our management given the available resources we have. And so as uh, Sally mentioned, we have uh, some of these resources that we'll try to make available to you. Um, one good resource that has lots of good technical information is the, the USDA's uh, weed risk assessment. Uh, they have lots of information on, on habit and form and propagation uh, methods, um, a seed bank viability, so lots of good data uh, uh, like that, but unfortunately, uh, because it's the USDA, um, they're, in, in, at least in this respect, are only coming up with these uh, cut sheets for uh, species that have been uh, deemed uh, noxious weeds. So we have many invasive species that just haven't made that, um, that, that, uh, that category, and so uh, they, they, aren't, uh, they might not have all the information on the species you're interested in. Uh, that EDRR map is a great um, a tool for understanding the spread uh, of a particular species to figure out you know, where it's coming from and where it's going. Uh, and again, the Cumberland Piedmont Network is a great resource for uh, understanding the organizational approach to our rapid response across the park service. Um, and then the, this Forest Service manual, or, or rather it's a private public partnership with a firm out of Nashville a uh, private firm that addresses invasive species as, in, in concert with the Forest Service. So that's something we can, we can make available to you as well. And so with that, I will uh, close and I'll bring back up the grid here. 
and um, stop our sharing. If I can figure out how. Oh, there we go. Trent? Okay. All right. Trent, can you hear me? Yes. There were a couple questions that came up um, during the discussion, um, and I'm just going to go through one by one. Yeah. Uh, one question is, how did you dispose of the hand-pulled vegetation? Did you haul it away or leave it to compost? We, it's, it's, uh, it is variable. Uh, so for example, the, um, the species we pulled at Orchard Knob, uh, we hauled those away and piled in a specific composting area on, on the Chickamauga battlefield site. Um, for, for example, for the, for the Mahonia species along the upper truck trail, we just left that on site. So, uh, and, and that's kind of um, um, access limited. It's hard to get equipment, uh, particularly along the upper truck trail. And so because we were just dealing with a handful of individuals, we just left them on site. But, but that is something to consider, um, not wanting to, you know, address a species on site A, but if it has viable seeds on the plant and you take it away and move it somewhere else, potentially you've got another uh, uh, dispersal uh, event. And so, yeah, that's always something to consider. And, and, and you know, I don't know that we do it perfectly all the time, but, but uh, we're, we're limited on how we can, we can dispose of, of those, uh, uh, you know, of, of those individuals that we take out. Uh, another question is, uh, would it be useful if we use the EDD app to help um, help you locate newly intruding invasive plants? Yes, it would be. And uh, the Park Service is uh, tapped in to some of these citizen science uh, platforms. EDD Maps is one of them, uh, but they also um, they also operate on iNaturalist as well. And so uh, the, I know the, the Cumberland Piedmont Network has a project, I think that's what they're called, on iNaturalist for um, tracking observations of exotic species and, and that gets reported and uh, there's a whole almost chain of custody, if you will, for, for how the, the park tracks uh, species like that, yes. Lynn, do you want to ask your question? Sure, and I would add also that uh, we do have some some uh, time here, and if anyone else would like to ask a question out loud, um, you can raise your hand in the participants box. So that's the box at the, if you click at the bottom of your screen and open up the participants box on the side, there's a feature you can raise your hand and ask to be called on and Sally will unmute you if you'd rather ask out loud. Um, but yeah, I have lots of questions. This is great. Thank you so much, Trent. Um, it, it's really difficult to find uh, exotic invasive, good, good exotic invasive management information. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of weird stuff out on the internet that's just kind of, uh, oh, well, I tried this once and it didn't go very well. Good luck, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yes, thank you so much. Um, I had a question uh, about, uh, do you um, ever, uh, th does the National Parks seed or replant in areas that you've done a lot of eradication work? Um, with my work, we worry about erosion and we can't really count on the seed bank to furnish a healthy plant community. Right. That's something I, I don't think locally um, is implemented very well. So unfortunately, no, I haven't seen that at Chickamauga. Uh, other parks with maybe more resources or, or expertise, they might have those uh, protocols in place, uh, but, but you're right. Uh, if, uh, it's probably too much trouble to go back to the slide, but on our second visit I showed to the eagle's nest, it was just kind of a barren wasteland. And so uh, that, that's just a, 
a function of the, the species we removed, but also as we chipped larger individuals through chippers, it now lays down mulch. And so um, while that might help in some regards to erosion, uh, it's not, it wasn't, at least in, from what I know, in the forefront of, of the manager's minds to, uh, to come back and reseed that with uh, native species. We do have uh, uh, some reseeding efforts going on along the Tennessee River uh, uh, at uh, Moccasin Bend, uh, but that's uh, unre unrelated to exotic uh, removal. That's just um, just just erosion and, and revegetation for for the the, the stream stream bank. But um, yes, I agree. We need to have that uh, more focused, uh, particularly on larger areas where we have done lots of removal methods or efforts. I should say that's just huge. You know especially for those of us in really older neighborhoods uh, and all the stuff is coming in all around us all the time, all the wisteria, all the bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can go out there and cut stump it. So what? Uh, it's all just waiting, giggling. Can't wait till you're gone. Ha ha ha. ha. Right. That's why the revisiting is such a big, uh, proponent of or, or portion of our invasive species response is, um, you know, if, if there's viable seeds in the seed bank that are invasive, um, then we're just allowing another crop of exotics to come up. Uh, and so we have to stay on top of it. And it's a, it's in large part of, of again, like I mentioned, a very long term problem that it really takes years of, of effort. Great. Uh, were there any okay. other? There was. A... Yep. <laughs> yeah. There. Christina put her question in there, and that is, does the Park Service work with private property owners that are in or border park lands to help with invasive removal? I know. Um, you know, uh, Reflection Riding as an organization that that borders the Park Service has been a reliable partner. Um, and so that, that uh, citywide invasive um, uh, removal day was, was a, a good sort of impromptu partnership, at least on, on the day level, with, uh, with Reflection Riding and the Park Service. Um, so they're a great neighbor on that boundary of Lookout Mountain. Um, they obviously are very, they're much more uh, adapt to the, the public outreach. You know, they, they get lots of volunteers, and uh, if we can sort of co-opt them uh, on particular efforts, yes, that's a great example of a way we can um, connect with other agencies, whether that's uh, organizations like the Park Service, or, or rather uh, Reflection Riding, or individual property owners. Um, while I don't know of, of individual property owner assistance in removal, um, there, there is good relationships uh, in some cases on access. And so, for example, uh, that portion of the upper truck trail, uh, the National Park gate is technically on private property. And so we have a relationship with that owner uh, to allow us to use that gate and come and go as we please. And so, um, but, but cultivating those relationships further beyond just gate access is something that we're always interested in, but uh, uh, I don't know that it gets, it gets the attention that maybe it needs, I think. Uh, I have a, someone who has a very technical question, and I don't know if you're here to say, I'm not here to give medical advice, <laughs> but what is your preferred herbicide for cut stumping? Um, I have had limited experience in, in, in different herbicides. Um, um, I've really only used uh, glyphosate and uh, a couple other products. Uh, Garlon 3 and Garlon 4 uh, are a couple herbicides that the park uses. Uh, this is, is a very obvious, I think, in some cases, deficiency with the park's expertise. 
like like Lynn mentioned, uh, even within the Park Service, sometimes we we're, were using bad or or, or ill-informed information, and so uh, purchases of herbicide are often left up to the staff on site, and they have a crazy idea about something that they've seen and want to buy, and, and 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 maybe they use it, maybe they don't. Uh, uh, but to circle back, the, the, the herbicides that I have used, and a lot of it depends on concentration, and, and I want to emphasize the label restrictions on the herbicides. And so uh, some herbicide is good, more is better, but, but that's probably not the case. And so uh, plants respond differently to certain concentrations of these herbicides. And, and if a little will kill it, a lot will really kill it, but, but that using too much herbicide actually could could allow the plant to survive funnily enough and so uh, it would just have to be an herbicide that has the appropriate label um, allowances for the species that you're uh, addressing and that you follow the the label mixing requirements for for that uh, application that you're going to use I think that's all the, well, Lynn had one more question. It's very technical. You can ask it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if I have everyone's permission, I'll just go a little deeper. Um, the, the water quality nerd here. Um, I was wondering if you've ever come across any research or just personal experience uh, with exotic invasives. Um, a landscape dominated by exotic invasives having altered soil or water conditions? Have you seen infiltration rates in soil change or, um, you know, we're always nervous working in, in riparian areas for sure. these same reasons and making it harder or just changing what plants could live there? Yeah. Um... I know there's literature out there. I can't recall any of that that come to mind readily, but but uh, how how exotic invasives alter the water table, or they draw up more um, uh, water resources that that uh, the the natives aren't aren't doing, and so that uh, that lowers the water table and and, and essentially uh, limits the amount of water that at at the the I guess the horizon level that these other species are, are, are used to or that might require. Um, but something I think I have seen, although I haven't done the research in, is a, uh, I, I, I know of one area on the park, uh, on the main battlefield area, uh, right off Lafayette Road, there is a section that uh, is a clear wetland area and it is, it is rampant with privet. Uh, it's it's probably one of the more dense stands that we have on the park, unfortunately. Uh, I can only imagine that that is somehow altering that uh, that that wetlands, um, you know, what have you, all of it. Whether it's it's reducing the um, you know the fauna that are there, and obviously the other uh, what could be unique uh, wetland species like uh, vascular plant species that might that might be there. But I haven't seen, or I haven't done any long-term um, uh, digging in that that regard. But but that is another good point. So for example, we we saw this widespread privet uh, patch in this wetland, and um, um, there are things like cattails and and uh, um, oh, what else was there? But a couple other identifiers of, of aquatic habitat. Um, but because it was so dense it might be effective otherwise to use some of these machine methods where we just go in and bulldoze it. But we also have to consider the, the sensitivity of these uh, wetland sites. And so that prohibits that kind of uh, removal method. And so um, I guess going back to that side, we're always having to, to deal with circumstances that, that limit or prohibit certain removal uh, activities. Thank you so much. Um, if there are, are there any other oh. questions? Did we have one more, Sally? Oh, I was just going to say, um, 
there was a little discussion about how everyone or several people said we need to take a tour of the Chickamauga battlefield. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, limestone glade. Of course, we've yeah. got this little uh, coronavirus thing to deal with before we're out and about. Um, but that is definitely going on our, our list. So yeah, yeah the glades are that. Didn't take long for the glades to now be my favorite place in the world. They're just so <laughs> cool. They're harsh. You think, how can that plant survive with a half inch soil? It's 90 degrees one day and, you know, uh, there's a study out of, uh, that came out of a, a, a Stones River National Battlefield that, that recorded temperatures in the glade to be like 120 degrees. And it's just, it's like a parking lot. And anyway, it's just really cool. <laughs> Come visit. <laughs> I hear it's snaking. Actually, there. Hmm. I haven't and seen a snake. Actually, maybe I got lucky. Yeah, there's one more question. That is, uh, on orchard now right now. Oh, uh, so, say that again. It was breaking up. Is, is the, the uh, clematis? Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. They're just asking if the clematis you mentioned is blooming on Orchard Knob right now. I'm not sure. I saw Dr. Craddock shaking his head, so maybe he knows. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't recall typing. what the flowering time is, yeah. So, so no, the reservation's not open. Uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, all public access has been um, you know, uh, canceled essentially. So uh, what I can tell you is that we're hoping to open in, the, in a phased, you know, reopening um, where, sorry, got a phone call. But anyway, uh, we're hopefully the first thing that's, will, the first thing that will be open are those open spaces like the trails and, and, and whatnot. You won't be able to congregate at like a picnic table, but you could, you could go down the trail. Um, but that's uh, to be determined. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a good handle. Just like everyone else, we're just kind of figuring it out. All right. Well, let's hope we can get back out to some of our favorite places again soon. Um, I guess we will wrap it up for the night. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll remind everyone that we have some resources on the Wild Ones website, too. Um, I know that probably people are inspired at this moment to tackle their backyards. So uh, please check out the resources that Trent has shared with us and that Sally has posted in the chat box. And um, yeah, the, uh, the Wild Ones website has some great resources as well. And uh, thank you all so much for bearing with us through uh, these these changes to how we get together. It's really nice to see see some folks, uh, even if it's not quite the same. And thank you, Trent, so much for coming out tonight and bearing with us as well and being flexible tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed kind of pulling this together, and uh, I hope everyone can take something from this and and use it to to take out at least one. Uh, nasty plan. So thank you for having me. Trent, thank you for what you're doing. We know you're outgunned, Under. outfunded, underfunded, but uh, you're fighting a good fight and it sounds like a knife fight, but thank you for what you're doing. Well, we thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Trent. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, Trent. Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so are we. Thanks so much. All right. You I'll, I'll see y'all later. Thanks again.